Yeah, first off, I want to say thanks uh, for inviting me to speak here. Uh, I think OSARC is like the one place where all the different tools, they can come together. And it's important to have that kind of place. So I'm re very grateful that uh, it, now it's actually a reality and it seems to be used quite well. So amazing uh, effort from the whole community. And thank you for for doing that. I wish I was a little bit more active personally in there. Uh, hopefully I'll start being. I've been incredibly busy uh, making a couple of courses. And so now I have a little bit more open time. So I'll try to join a few chats. But anyways, so... Uh, I'm going to talk about architectural concept design with Blender. Uh, so, so just a little bit about me. Um, I'm Demeter. Hi to everybody that doesn't know me. And I'm currently working as a project architect at HOK in London. Um, I'm also a design director of UH Studio, which is my small company. Uh, I do independent research projects and a lot of collaborations. And I'm also an educator at UH Studio Design Academy. Previously, I worked at a big company in the UK called HHMM and Agile Associates. I've been educated on both sides of the ocean. So I did my undergraduate in Philadelphia and I did my postgraduate at the Architecture Association in London. Oops. Uh, a little bit about HOK in case you don't know them. They're, uh, we are a big international company. Uh, and we have offices in the US, London, Middle East, Asia. And uh, we typically work on large and complex projects across many typologies. So these are not projects I have worked on personally, but they're some of the more popular, more famous ones. Uh, so we have on one side, where's my cursor? I'm going to turn on the laser pointer. So so that's a very old project, but it's a thin shell church, I think in St. Louis, uh, where HOK started. This is the NASA Smithsonian Museum in DC. Uh, this is the LaGuardia Airport in New York, which was completed a few years ago. And this is the Salvador Dali Museum in Florida. Uh, this is a mosque, actually. And I believe it's Riyadh, but I might be wrong. And this is a BMW, uh, or sorry, <laughs> Mercedes museum, in, uh, not museum, arena. And I think it's in Atlanta that's recently opened. Uh, so these are the projects that I have worked on. So this is a theater in uh, London, not in London, in Derby, in north of London, about an hour and a half. And this is my most recent project, which is a tower to mixed use residential building in Lagos in Nigeria. That's currently actually on site. And New Age Studio. So I try to do in New Age Studio what I cannot do at HOK. And it's a lot of sometimes smaller projects, a lot of experimental projects and a lot of research. So trying to find different me means, ways and methods to create and I also run the UH Studio Design Academy YouTube channel and courses. So just released this one that's been keeping me busy for a while, Blender Architecture Masterclass. But I have some more which are on the website, uhstudio.com. And this is some of my uh, projects which you'll hear a little bit more about, conceptual ones. So what is Blender? used for within the architecture field. So we definitely know about architectural visualization. That's the most popular one. We also know it's used as a design tool. And as of more recently, uh, with BIM and documentation tool with the help of Blender BIM and the set of tools that go along with that, that work well with Blender BIM. So I'm going to be focusing on speaking about Blender as a design tool. That's how I use it for the most part. And so, yeah, how can Blender really be used within architecture of design? So as a design tool, there's a couple of different ways, more than a couple actually, that it works and it works pretty well. So the first one is fast and semi-procedural workflow. And then the second way is subdivision modeling and digital sculpting. These two, they kind of go hand in hand 
with, with each other. And then there's tessellation with the tissue add-on and geometry nodes. So quite a different ways that we can use Blender as a design tool. And the primary reason for me though, that it's super fast. Once you learn the basics of it, once we understand how it works, uh, being able to work with, with Blender, I think saves me, saves my team, uh, saves the company a lot of time to be able to iterate much quicker in regards to design. So let's talk about the first one as a semi-procedural design tool. So we've got our typical design tools. So Rhino, Revit, Archicad, SketchUp on one hand. And on the other hand, we have parametric and scripting tools like Grasshopper, Dynamo, C Sharp, and Python scripting everywhere. But what's missing is that intermediate area, what, how we can kind of interact between the two. Because sometimes being too parametric takes a long time. So I know Grasshopper well. I use Rhino and Grasshopper uh, almost daily in my workflow. So I know the software quite well, and I know how long it can take to build something with Grasshopper. And here's an example little script. It's very simple. This was for a competition that we did. And it's, you know, a circle with three radii. So that script looks like this. And even for somebody that uses Grasshopper on an almost daily basis, it takes a while to build it up. So who occupies that middle space where it's not quite explicit modeling and it's quite not quite parametric modeling, but something in between. That's what I'm interested in because it has some of the uh, smart ways to use software in regards to being parametric, but at the same time, it's very free. So there's a couple of ones, right? So on one hand, we have we definitely have Blender. We've got FreeCAD in there and we have Maya. So Zachary Hadid uses Maya all the time. And more recently, Katia as well, which is trying to venture more into the AEC space. So all of these softwares, they're trying, maybe they're not trying, but architects and designers are finding ways in which they can use them in that uh, intermediate step between explicit and completely parametric workflow. So as an example, in Blender, creating the same thing that I created in Grasshopper takes, as you know, a couple of modifiers and we already have a scheme. So it's very fast to be able to iterate through conceptual designs. Uh, another example. So this is an air co airport competition that we did a long time ago um, at HOK. This was for Terminal 6 for Heathrow. Um, we didn't win it. It's a very political project. I think in the end it will get built, but because of COVID, it may get pushed back. Uh, Grimshaw won the project. So I, I have a funny story with this. I was asked in the 11th hour to help out with the roof. And we literally have two hours before we need to submit to the rendering company. So they asked me to come in and help with the roof. So naturally, I did it with Blender and naturally it turned out pretty well. Um, the setup is pretty simple. So there's one array in one direction and then a second array in a second direction and a third array. There we have a couple of lattices. And just like that, something that would take so long and even doing it in Grasshopper could be done in two hours in Blender and still be able to represent the idea that we're trying to present with our design proposal. Uh, this is a little bit more technical, but it also illustrates some of the some of Blender's strengths. So this is for a music venue, an outdoor music venue, and the idea was that the venue is a bit open, but we have a permanent kind of tower and rig set up. So whenever an event organizer comes, they can use the current infrastructure. So all of this is done in Blender with just arrays. And it's super fast, much faster than it would be to even build it with Grasshopper or explicitly. And then this is from my current master class, where again, there's I teach ways where we can really easily combine modifiers to be able to iterate quickly through designs. For example, here everything uses a big boolean, which is linked to the roof geometry. So anytime we adjust the roof podium geometry. Uh, the curtain wall gets adjusted as well. And the same thing with the floors, which are array-based with a cap on top. 
So pretty straightforward stuff, but if you combine a couple of these, then we start to get fairly interesting designs fairly quickly. So we talked about a couple of different ways where Blender is quite useful. So the second one and the third one is subdivision modeling and digital sculpting. Now, when I say digital sculpting, I don't mean uh, something like ZBrush where we're literally sculpting. I mean having some geometry that we can use and it's really easy to modify. For example, in Rhino or other nervous-based software, including FreeCAD, we usually start with the line and we love between two lines, so we create surfaces from that sketch or from, from those lines. And from those surfaces, we extrude and we do our Boolean operations. So everything starts from 2D. And depending on what we are doing, that can take a lot of time. Because in 3D, with, uh, with mesh modeling tools, and, and, and these are not only available in Blender, but in all the mesh modeling programs, we could iterate much quicker if we understand how to work with uh, mesh tools. So that's what I call digital sculpting. And nobody does this better in architecture besides Zaha Hadid. In fact, uh, a lot of my colleagues from DAA have gone on to work there. So in a similar fashion, we worked on a competition entry for a tram station in the Middle East. And this is completely using subdiv in Blender. We had a lot to play with it, but we, we had to understand scale. So uh, it turned out pretty well. Now, I already mentioned this theater. Uh, the interior, though. So, again, it, with some of these competitions, or this wasn't even a competition, this was a commissioned project, but it w they, there wasn't funding. We had to create a design, and then the council had a client in mind, somebody that was interested to sponsor it. So we had to have a design with which the council can go and approach that client. So it's a bit like competition, but not quite so. We knew what the brief was. So that space is again using subdiv modeling. And theaters, they tend to be quite sculptural. They're, they're not just a box and a place where you can sit and see it, but the edges and the roof are typically done in a sculptural manner. So that's the final result, again, with, as you can see, the model is, is fi fairly straightforward. If you understand how to work with subdivision modeling, you understand that this is uh, pretty straightforward as long as you understand the architectural concepts behind it in regards to scale, in regards to uh, the requirements of a theater, sight lines, and so on. But in terms of 3D modeling flow, it's quite straightforward. And there's, there's, uh, then there's loads of different ways where I've been lucky enough to use Blender professionally. Uh, for example, for doing some proposals for uh, cultural quarters in a city in the UK as well. And as you can imagine, all of these are once again done with modifiers fairly quickly and easy to organize. Uh, so in the Blender Masterclass that I talked initially, uh, I, I'm focusing more in there with the basic semi-procedural workflows. But this one, which I released earlier, uh, it gets nitty gritty with understanding how to work with subdivision modeling for architectural design and really narrowing down the work set. And so this is not procedural anymore, but it's still pretty quickly to work with Blender and applying some of these elements and even getting all the panels that you see here on the tower that sits on top, they're all the same uh, dimensions. So it's proper panelization done directly in Blender. And that's the second result. I'm planning to create a visualization course as a follow-up. I'm not sure when that will happen, but I had to play with it to see how far I can push it as well. So the next step, which is very important, is tessellation. And tissue is a godsend for this because it makes working with tessellations a breeze. Uh, it works naturally with uh, mesh modeling, with quad modeling, with the way that uh, you model in, in with uh, Blender in any case. So there are a lot of facade studies. This was for a very complex competition. Unfortunately, I can't show more than just this screenshot. But 
the facade was uh, uh, double curved and the only way I could map this quickly, so this is just for competition, right? We're not, we don't have the engineers on board to figure out the correct sizes and everything, but to model this in the quickest way possible um, to add the impact that we wanted to do it, we did it with tissue and we could push with, uh, um, what was it called now, vertex groups, with vertex groups proximity, which you see as the heat map, how far the effect of some of those facade panels is to pushing out. And I've done loads of different ones for different uh, uh, projects. I worked a lot in sport a few years ago, so naturally it's a good place to test out big tessellations where Blender becomes very handy, both for digital sculpting and later for tessellation and testing out different materials. And this is a tower that I did a long time ago. I think it was for the Blender conference two years ago. Uh, so it's actually very sculptural, but at the same time, quite tessellated, as you can see as well. And uh, with, with the tissue add-on, this is pretty easy. It's really straightforward to do this, surprisingly so. Uh, how you schedule that and how you can take that the next step maybe with Blender BIM, it would be an interesting question I have to all of you, to whoever is more f most familiar with that, because I would know how, I would like to know how to take some of these concepts, you know, and move them uh, further down the uh, design road, maybe within Blender, because the way that I would typically approach this is we build it almost from scratch in Grasshopper and start to schedule some of those elements, because simply I don't know how to how how it could be, how, how these kinds of panels could be scheduled within Blender. Not that it doesn't exist, I'm sure there are ways, I'm just not familiar with them yet. And that's the same building. And the last one is Geometry Nodes, which is fairly new. I try to play with it uh, in many ways and see how it can be used and see how it can be used not only as a grasshopper replacement, but in a way that could be combined with some of the existing tools that already exist in Blender. So this, I'm creating a YouTube video for this. It's going to be out um, within a few days, uh, but it's very simple and straightforward. And as you can see, the grasshopper script, the grasshopper, uh, sorry, the geometry node tree is very simple. And that's because it's also using modifiers. So in this case, we start with a simple shape. Then that shape gets um, remeshed using the remesh modifier. And so that's the result on which we apply this tree, which just takes every point on this remesh and applies one of one or two or three or four different panels. So I really like this approach. I really like it because it combines, again, a lot of the inherent possibilities that we have within Blender with, if, with modifiers. And we can use something more complex with geometry nodes without having to do everything uh, manually in geometry nodes or in Svirtchalk for that matter, uh, where you have to literally define every single part of it. In some ways, I feel like I'm a, a lazy designer. Uh, I want things quickly. I don't want to spend too much time. I spent a lot of time designing with Grasshopper when I started you know, making these ridiculously complex scripts only for the client or somebody else to come a couple of days later with some feedback and tell us that we need to change the way that the massing works or the model or the project works, which meant at that point that I have to redesign the whole script to create the project. So that's why I'm uh, looking forward to the development of geometry nodes a lot. I think it's gonna have uh, an even more significant impact on with using Blender and it will give some people um, a way to come in and use Blender outside of, uh, uh, within the architecture community. Uh, I play with attractors a lot, uh, just typical uh, parametric exercises of 
of, of having an attractor that moves things a lot. So we, again, with geometry nodes, it's fairly straightforward, fairly easy. And this is quite random. Um, again, it's uh, on a YouTube video, but it, I think it gives a lot of people the understanding of how it works. And one thing that it does highlight though, is, is the speed of geometry node for creating complex things. Um, there's a lot of geometry. So if I have this much geometry in Rhino, it won't work well. The viewport will be quite sluggish. Whereas in geometry nodes, in Blender, with two times, three times, four times as much geometry, you won't even feel the difference. Uh, there won't be any lag, basically. I'm working on an example where all these buildings are actual proper buildings, not just blocks, um, to see how far it can be pushed. But even with that, so far it's performing pretty well. And here is a, whoops. And, and here's another example, more recent one, where I thought, okay, so Twisted Towers, you know, classic uh, architectural parametric exercises. How do they work in uh, geometry nodes? Like, what does that look like in geometry nodes? And then what does it look like in Grasshopper? And I was surprised, actually, that even though I'm not looking for direct replaceability of Grasshopper, I think Grasshopper is great. Uh, because it's nerves based, so it works really well with uh, Rhino's tool set. So I'm not looking for a direct replaceability of what geometry nodes can do versus Grasshopper, but at the same time, it's quite interesting to compare that some things are now possible uh, just as easy, if, if not easier, with geometry nodes versus uh, Grasshopper. And not only that, so I, I, I'm not showing it here, but I try to take this tower and make it really high, quite tall. And in Rhino, it's, it wasn't performing well, uh, not even in the shaded viewport, just in a regular viewport. And geometry nodes, again, because everything is instanced, uh, it performs really well. For the purposes of this, I also built the same, I, I built these in the exact same way in both softwares. In Grasshopper, it might be built a different way if I didn't want to replicate it in geometry nodes because Grasshopper tends to have a bit more expandability with these kinds of things. But it's one floor, there's just a rate and rotate it. So quite straightforward. All right, so that's it. I am I went through this a little bit quicker than I thought I would go through it. In my head, I thought it was going to take much longer, but maybe that's okay because we can open it to questions in case somebody has some. Yes, definitely. Definitely very interesting, uh, Dimitar. Uh, are there any questions? Anybody wants to... I've been following Dimitri a long time and I saw his his youtube videos and he's so cool the things that he do and and i think they uh, like he said a uh, geometry nodes will be a step forward it's like dynamo in it and and we need to learn more programming <laughs> <laughs> yes definitely there's a uh, probably a bit more learning to do, but uh, so far, especially there's a there's there's a lot of changes that is that are happening in geometry nodes. At the moment, the the way that they work, the design is not quite good. It's very linear, uh, but the team, the dev team in Blender, is aware of that, and there's two new proposals that are hopefully going to make it much easier to use as well. But but I also know that the Blender community is gonna. And when they, they already keep, everybody keeps adding new amazing content and new tutorials. So uh, hopefully it should make it pretty easy to learn. Yes, yes. Is there any other question? I can, uh, maybe I can ask a question. Sure. So what would be the, the a wish list for you for Blender? For the next, let's say, versions, what you would you like to see more to go in which direction? 
Hmm. I think the spreadsheet, uh, I'm quite a big fan of the spreadsheet. I want to see all the properties being able to, to be exposed. Uh, and there, it, there is already ways in Blender where it's quite easy to add like custom properties to, to objects. Uh, being able to see that in a spreadsheet, I would think uh, would bring like uh, so, some ways to natively work with, 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 uh, oh, with later phases in design. Uh, the other thing that I'm quite keen is everything notes, which essentially, as far as I understand it so far, is going to make the whole uh, program quite procedural. Uh, so in a way where we have like the history exposed everywhere. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, I do wish that some things in Blender do work better for architectural design, um, which has a lot to do with the performance. Now, in these examples, the small design examples, they they can they do get handled quite well. But once we have to import our geometry in a context, and that context is really large, then Blender still struggles a lot. So I hope that the performance gets better. And I think for 3.0, they're finally listening to the community on that front and improving the performance quite a bit. I have a good friend who has an architecture company and we actually met because of Blender, uh, but he uses 3ds Max in his office just because Blender cannot handle the big files that he works on daily that are required for the more complex architectural visualization. So also for the for rendering, for example, from that uh, perspective. Yes, yeah. So, well, I, the way that it works is in the viewport, it's not so much for rendering, but just the performance of the viewport. Uh, if you have a big project with a lot of objects and you have to modify things and you have to edit them, it might take quite a bit of time to be able to adjust that and to edit it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, for your experience with uh, other uh, tools, for FreeCAD, for example? FreeCAD is great. I really love FreeCAD. I really wish I had more time to explore FreeCAD. The base is absolutely amazing. I Every once in a while, I really go into it and delve deep. Uh, it's just a tool set on top of that base, on top of the, the kernel, uh, that needs a lot of development to be able to bring it to a level where it's easy for uh, everyday designers to, to approach it. But the inherent parametricism in there is amazing. And the kernel, it works better in some ways than Rhino's kernel, which is amazing. So in Rhino, a lot of uh, arcs, they get changed into splines and things like that. So in other words, in Rhino, it's very easy to work with um, splines and lofts, but not so straightforward to work with simple lines and simple arcs, which is, if you think about constructability of projects, that's much more important than having splines and having some cool shapes. So in FreeCAD, it's not only really easy to work with lines and with curves, but it's really easy to work with them parametrically. Whereas with Grasshopper, you actually have to set up quite a few rule sets to be able to do that. So I think it has a lot, a lot of potential. Uh, I just wish there was somehow a way to allow for more development to tidy up the existing tools and to, to, to polish the existing tool set and to make some of the tools a little bit better. Uh, so far, FreeCAD could work fairly well for uh, smaller projects, uh, but I tend to work on larger projects that are slightly more complex. And, and in those kinds of projects, the tools that we need, for example, for, for scheduling, uh, for, for SADs, for, for panelization and things like that, they're not quite there yet in FreeCAD. Okay, okay, thank you. Yes, yes, and uh, let's say that uh, at some point uh, with uh, the Blender Beam, and uh, if then there are also simulations, open source simulation workflows that uh, maybe can be, let's say, associated with uh, this concept design, 
so that you can uh, make also decisions uh, also on, on uh, results, engineering results, and, uh, and so on. It could be something uh, interesting, let's say, to, to put together. Definitely. Um, I haven't had a chance to explore Blender BIM too much. I think I tried it once or twice. Uh, so I, I'm actually looking for somebody that could teach me <laughs> or or not teach me completely, but like show me the way that, you know, maybe like one of the, the examples that I've shown could be, could start to be implemented in Blender BIM. Uh, okay. So Yes, yes. Maybe we can uh, set uh, some screen share or... Uh, uh, a user meeting or something. Yeah. Blender yeah, because be nice. Because a lot of people on my YouTube channel are asking me now for Blender BIM. It's becoming, which is good because it's becoming popular and people are, are hearing about it. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So it can be something to be arranged. Yeah. I, I mean, and, you know, even. Beyond, I, guess, I guess also. And uh, yes, yes. Nice. Even what's on the screen here, it would be interesting to see like what, what kind of information can be pulled from that model and how can that be scheduled? How what would the IFC look like? Uh, yeah, I'm interested. Yes, yes. More importantly, maybe also what uh, what it can give you more, let's say. Uh, yeah. Because now, for example, uh, if you create the world, you can have uh, all the piece set, the properties also for uh, be able to, to do the bill of quantities and everything. Also the costing is there, the 4D. So yeah, the structural. So it can be something interesting. Structural, definitely. Yeah, I, I mean, at the moment, you know, if any of these concepts uh, so, so yeah, it's in, in continuation in my workflow, I, I would do a concept in Blender uh, and depending on it, sometimes it will get completely rebuilt in Rhino. Sometimes I'll salvage some of the geometry and build upon it in Rhino and it eventually gets pushed to Revit. And then we work with all the other consultants that we, in a typical fashion where we share with them a Revit model and they give us back their information. Uh, we, we're getting more, stru especially structural engineers, you know, they're working with Tecla. So IFC is uh, getting better. And thankfully, Revit's, uh, it's the big hurdle in IFC, right? Like they don't, uh, I don't think they're using like the latest, I don't even know too much about it, but I, I believe they're not using the latest IFC schema and they're always like a version or two behind in their software. So it's unfortunate because then all the other companies that they have to work with, with them, they have to push their models and dumbify them in a way. Yes, and then uh, sometimes engineers, they have to start from zero, let's say, to create a new model or an existing model if you don't have compatibility. And, uh, so for sure, the compatibility there is very important. Yes, yeah. Very nice. Are there any other questions or comments from anybody else? Uh, I have a very general comment of um, I, I have been working on something similar with HOK in London um, more than eight years ago. So I'm, okay. I'm very, very pleased to to see the um, well the, the the thinking continuing. So yeah, I, I have a long list of shout outs to people and and former colleagues to to say but i'll i'll follow follow you on twitter or whatever else and and send a a, a note so yeah ver very pleased to to see the this project um i was modeling the baku flame towers back in the day Just all right to, yeah, to, men to mention one that yes. <laughs> that may resonate cool i what's your name and did you happen <laughs> to work with uh, well, Paul, Paul Duggleby and, and Robbie Gordon have been there forever, right? Yes. So, yeah. Uh, so I'm William Lopez Campo. Okay. Know. Nice to meet you, William. Likewise. Yes. Likewise. Cool. Small world, eh? Yep. Well, I'm, I'm going back to checking what's, what's going on in, in OpenBIM. So, yeah. Um, glad to be here. Great. Yeah. 
Very nice, very nice. So uh, I think that uh, it's time to close this meetup. Dimitar, I want to thank you for uh, this presentation. It has been a pleasure to have you and uh, uh, we will uh, be always uh, around. Thanks for having me. And yes, we'll definitely speak more. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, everybody.